Well, thank you very much. Uh, Jack of all trades, master of none, basically what we've got here. Uh, I'm basically uh, Professor Daniel George as a substitute, so uh, this is uh, really my way of a backup. But this is a marvellous excuse to explore some of the things that I've been interested in for a, a very long time, going back into the 1950s. And uh, some of you will probably recognise, but not all of you, because it's a very young audience here. Um, these are the characters from the radio series Journey into Space. And uh, when that was produced, which was 1953, people were recovering from one of the worst periods of austerity we ever had. And people were very positive, uh, thinking about going into space, going to Mars, going to the moon. And in this program, they got to the moon in 1965 and to Mars a few years later. Uh, very impressively, and they did it actually in rather good technical style. And that was because they had terrific advisors on the program. Now, that austerity period I think is here now, and we need to have a good look at what we're doing in space exploration, and that's what this talk's going to be about. Um, I will ask you one question whilst I remember uh, to think about till the end of the talk, which is, what's the Scottish connection here? between these guys you could see. Try and think about what uh, that might be. The, the, you'll find some strange references to Scotland uh, in this talk as you go through. It. You say, Scotland is a peculiar country for developing ideas well ahead of its time, and uh, I've always found that fascinating. But before I start, I would like to say, uh, on behalf of most of the scientific community who are represented in Glasgow, is that uh, today, we lost one of the really great theoretical physicists and cosmologists, Stephen Hawking, uh, who died in the early hours of this morning. And he's probably been one of the most amazing scientists that's been around in the UK, uh, if not in the world. Uh, because not only has he solved some amazing problems and made us think very hard about things, but he's been able to communicate that to ordinary people. And he's probably produced more real stimulus uh, on some of the hardest sides of science uh, that anyone has done. Uh, most science that you see on television is so dumbed down to appeal to the so-called man in the street that it's not worth listening to. Uh, they don't see any joy in anything. But he was really good at getting past that. And uh, I think it's only right that someone should stand up and say that he did a damn good job and, uh, to last with that illness for that long. is is amazing fortitude. So I thought I'd just say that. Okay. <laughs> now to turn to something slightly different. I was wondering how to start this talk, and I, I thought I would do. This is the age of Donald Trump and fake news and things like that. So I'm going to give you a fake quote. Um, people I know have been using this quote for years, but there was a person before Donald Trump and he was called Dan Quayle. And uh, Dan Quayle was vice president for the first George Bush. And uh, his job as vice president is to be in charge of NASA, the, the Aeronautics and Space Administration. And the apocryphal story is that he came in for NASA with this huge audience of thousands of people sitting there wondering what he was going to do about the budget and things like this. And he started off by saying, ladies and gentlemen, space is big. <laughs> really big. <laughs> Unfortunately, the budget wasn't. Uh, and what I'm going to try and get at tonight is that there's something bigger than space, which is the cost of trying to explore it with human beings. And we're in a period of austerity. We need to think how big it is. And uh, just to show you how big it is, I'm not going to go very far to this. I thought we should just ring up our neighbours to see how big space is. And uh, here we are, this is our, the biggest nearby galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, it's only two and a half thousand million, uh, uh, two and a half million light years away. Um, and it takes light about 220,000 years to cross from one side to the other. And why it's interesting is it looks exactly like our galaxy, the Milky Way. And it's only recently been shown this year that it is almost exactly the same size. And the reason why we need to think about this is we all have bad neighbours. <laughs> this is a bad neighbour. 
this neighbor is coming towards us at a slight angle, and it will hit us in 4,000 billion years. <laughs> uh, that's why we need to develop, to develop serious space travel, and we've got some time to do it. So, this is what the talk is about. I want to just go through a bit of history, some aspirations. Uh, uh, we have the technology, uh, a little cold war story. Uh, then some serious stuff on the costs of space flight, and by which I mean human space flight, is where I take my argument. And what the hazards are of doing something really stupid, like trying to colonize Mars. Uh, my attitude towards finding an austerity way of doing this so we can explore space on the cheap and more leisurely and more intelligently is to look at some of the modern things that have emerged since the early space program. So I'm going to do a, sorry, a couple of examples, uh, one of which is uh, remote sensing, which we had something to do with in uh, Glasgow, and robots and swarms, uh, which we also had something to do with. And I'll try and put that in some general pictures. This is a gigantic topic, so uh, I, I can't cover everything. But the big strange thing in all this is, what about these billionaires, like Elon Musk and things like that? And uh, one reason that I'm glad I've actually put something in on this is that Stephen Hawking did a lot for the billionaires who are entering space flight or trying to promote space flight by just being a champion for it, and he's done a marvelous job on that, and I'll conclude. So, uh, when did it all start? Uh, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky in 1903, uh, worked out the theory of what we needed to do to go into space, basically with rockets. Uh, it wasn't well known uh, outside his native country. Uh, but anyway, everyone was well equipped to understand space flight because Jules Verne and H.G. Wells had moved their adventures into space because they'd run out of things to do on the Earth. And the only serious person around was a real experimentalist, Robert Goddard, who's here, who uh, thought he'd just build the rockets and get on with it. And that's what he did. And, uh, the rockets of his inspired rocket societies in America, Germany, Soviet Union, and Britain. And in Britain, the British Interplanetary Society was founded in 1933, and their most insignificant moment was when I joined in 1957. <laughs> uh, being British, we did it differently from everybody else. Uh, the British Interplanetary Society was full of real experts. They designed rockets that were going to build uh, liquid-fueled rockets to fly into space. Uh, and then the government thwarted them by the Explosives Act of 1875, which prohibited all this in the UK. And uh, so only theory was allowed, so we didn't do very much. But Werner von Braun, in Germany, uh, managed to swing the entire Nazi vengeance program uh, around to his way of thinking and building V-2 rockets with the aid of slave labor, and, uh, which wasn't really recognized until after the war. And he also was the person who developed the post-war US military rockets and ultimately the Saturn V rocket that got them to the moon. Similar stuff was going on in the Soviet Union. The military and traveling in space are always mixed together. Uh, this is him here, oh, sorry, this is him here um, talking to all these uh, military people at the Ballistic Missile Agency. There were people who didn't agree with all this. Uh, Two astronomer royals, uh, Spencer Jones and Woolley, who was his successor, uh, in early 1957, both of them independently said, space travel is bunk, or space travel is utter bilge. Now you have to look at these words now to find out what these really mean, because nowadays we'd be much more fragrant about the next person. And in both these cases, these guys knew exactly what they're talking about. I totally agree with them. If they'd seen this first slide, they'd say, yes, that's what we mean. We're not going to Andromeda. Not soon. But a few weeks after, the first book went up. And then in 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first person in space. But the, the only thing I can say about these guys who sadly died now, that Lord Kelvin did the same thing. He said radio has no future in 1897. Well, they didn't have the presenters. I think that was the problem. <laughs> Well, we have the technology, uh, this is just a fast summary of it, to the moon, the glory days, six landings on the moon, uh, 12 astronauts uh, uh, altogether, in the period 1968 to 1972. 
public lost interest about 1972, and it's been a struggle uh, to keep that type of dream alive. And it was a pure military and economic battle between the Soviet Union and America that made this happen, but the brilliant science and engineering going on in it. How they did this with the rubbish computers they had in those days, I, I just don't know. It's quite incredible. Um, so there we are, someone walking on the moon, and you can guess which one it is, because the one with the camera is Armstrong, and he's photographing his friend, who's uh, Buzz Aldrin. But not everyone believed it. <laughs> and it died down for a bit, this scepticism, along with the flat earth and things like this. But it was resurrected by Capricorn One, which was a Hollywood movie in 1977, which brought it all back again. It's never gone away. There are people who go through the photographs from that year and say, don't think the world's flat, couldn't do it. So where's the money gone, is what I'm saying. Anyway, here's a Cold War story for you, which will show you some of the things that went on. There were spy satellites from the early days, and uh, mainly because aircraft were getting shot down. Um, so spy satellites were doing quite early. This is the Baikonur uh, rocket base in the Soviet Union in early 1969. And uh, you can see here that there's various things to look at. Uh, if you were a skilled observer, you would see there's all sorts of stuff in here. Um, here you can see quite clearly, on the bottom left and the top right, two huge rockets. And you can't quite see that, I suppose, but there are people trained to take those images uh, and turn them into drawings. So there's one which is pretty scruffy, uh, of two rockets on a launcher. And uh, this is what a single one looks like. You can see this thing, I mean, this laser's not really far away, you can see it's big. It's about the size of a Saturn V rocket. This is the Soviet moon rocket. And the space race that we all remember hearing about in the 1970s was a real race because NASA knew the Soviet Union had a rocket that could go to the moon. This is their moon rocket. They built about seven of them altogether. So what happened? This is early 1969. Well, uh, there was, uh, there's the moon rocket. That's a Soviet photograph, Soviet era photograph of it. You see a funny looking thing. And uh, this was a photograph taken again by a spy satellite in autumn 1969, and you can see that that base has been blown to pieces. There's been a huge explosion there. And uh, this was known. And if you look at the Soviet logs, in February 1969, uh, one of the M1 rockets, this giant moon rockets, failed. Uh, July the 3rd, just before the American moon landing, another one failed at launch. And in, uh, later on in uh, 1971 and 72, the others failed. But these two in 1969 stopped the chances of Russia going directly to the moon, not going to the TV at all. And NASA knew that. And this was not widely known. It was known a bit in the scientific community, but it wasn't widely known that this was a real race. And they had no way of knowing whether that rocket could be manned or not. Um, anyway, it was uh, an extraordinary thing. And, um, July the 20th, Armstrong and Aldrin land on the moon. Well, this brings you to some of the hazards. How many astronauts have there been? This is quite difficult because it keeps changing. But uh, I've tried to count this up. I think there's been 562, uh, most in Earth orbit, 12 landed on the moon. How many fatalities? 12 in space, mainly through the uh, shuttle uh, program where we lost two shuttles. Uh, during training, 13. And if you look at the number of fatalities due to rocket explosions, pre-1945, there were about 15, which is remarkably low, actually. And then 1960 to 2007, 280 people have been killed worldwide in rocket explosions. You don't hear about that very often. But it's a serious number. So 320 fatalities. Um, and this is how much it cost in real terms. Uh, this is a billion US dollars here on the vertical axis and normalize it to 2014. And the year from 1960 to 2020 is on the bottom here. Uh, actually, it's 2018. Yeah. Uh, the NASA budget, which is typical of space budgets in many ways, and some of it's hidden because it's military, but it's by a long shot, the much the biggest spender. And it's $19.1 billion at the moment per year. And you can see the peak 
uh, in the period when the Apollo missions were on that massive growth peak there, and it was 4% of uh, uh, the gross domestic product of the United States at that time. Huge uh, investment. And then there's all these other bumps on here. It's quite hard to make sense out of this, but it's been pretty flattish uh, since the mid-90s, basically. And yet they're preparing for a lot of things. How does it split? Well, manned spaceflight takes $8.7 billion. The scientific side takes $5.7 billion. Um, that works out as... Uh, the total is, is let's say, about 3% of the US defence budget, which is 686 billion, and the UK defence budget is about 56 billion, so it's about 34% of our uh, budget. Uh, there's lots of infrastructure, like all the things that are needed for the mission controls and things, and stage ground stations and things like that, so there's a huge amount of money uh, spent on stuff. How does the science budget work out? That's only 5.7 billion. The largest amount is planetary science, followed by earth science, and then the three little ones are astrophysics and telescopes, heliophysics, uh, the stuff around the sun, and the James Webb telescope, which is going to replace the Hubble uh, in a few years. That budget is roughly similar to the entire UK science resource budget, but as an overall spend in NASA's budget, it's quite small, and it's actually not very well done. NASA's big projects were Apollo, it took 11 years, and uh, that was uh, uh, the biggest, uh, apparently the biggest cost. But in fact, the Space Shuttle has been bigger, it's because it's been over a 30 year program. And the International Space Program is uh, 21 years, and the Mars mission, which is this big purple bit at the bottom, is going to take 18 years, and its present estimate, which I think is ultra conservative, is 450 billion. Dollars going to cost to kill the crew, basically. <laughs> there they are. I'll tell you why this is ridiculous uh, later on. So there they are being happy. They've got a PC. Ben <laughs> <laughs> and Mac have said this completely differently. So. Uh, and then there are other people who come on. The billionaires like Elon Musk, and this is SpaceX. The Falcon Heavy has just gone into orbit, carrying instead of a lump of concrete, which is what we normally put in the third stage when you're testing a launch it, he put his car in there. And all sorts of things. Maybe we'll see more of that later. And he wants to put this thing on Mars uh, in a few years. And you can pay a lot of money to do it. Go with it. Uh, there are other big players in space. I put this in at the last minute just to show that I've not ignored everyone. The really big player that's interesting is China who have got more bangs for the buck than anybody else over a long period of time. They've, been, they've had a space program that goes back way, and it's mixed up with the military as well. So it's been fed part of the military. But it's been quite amazing. And even India has got a, a pretty big program. It's done some quite good stuff. And uh, on t if you compare any of those figures with the US, they're nowhere near it. So it looks at first as though the Americans have got it signed up. Now these are the smaller projects. The Hubble telescope costs six billion over 20 years. So we call the uh, Wilkinson Pro. 0.1 plus $150 million. It's nothing. Uh, 10 plus years. Mars Curiosity, this is the thing here, it came down by an autonomous robot, lowered it to the ground. This is, to me, the biggest breakthrough yet in space exploration, not space exploration. A robot on its own landed that thing. And in the future you'll see the same, the same kind of thing going back into space with samples and so on. The Webb telescope, which will replace Hubble, uh, 9 billion. Uh, it's not a lot. Uh, small projects, but actually really worthwhile. And uh, I wanted to mention this Wilkinson microwave anisotropy probe. It was launched in 2001. Um, what did it do? Well. It worked out the age and flatness of the universe. It looked at the cosmic microwave background, basically. It looked at the distribution of ordinary matter, dark matter, dark energy, the origin of galaxies, all kinds of stuff. And it got the top three citations in physics and astronomy for this decade under a Nobel Prize. So it was amazing stuff. 150 million for that. And we've got guys going up there doing daft experiments with jello and things. Uh, in the International Space Station, never got near this, and it's cost billions to put them there. 
And I just don't see there's a comparison. Uh, so what's the balance? Well, human spaceflight has cost half the mass of Earth. The scientific returns have been pretty poor, mostly derived from the unmapped space programs. Uh, Hubble was launched and serviced by the shuttle, though, so it needed yeah. humans to fix it at one point, and that's an important point. But it's, again, a near-Earth thing, so I'm not too worried about that. Uh, lots of satellites were launched in that period, but nowhere near as num the numbers have gone up from different sites. There's been about 10,000 satellites plus. Um, each month, 30 or 40 go up as you're documented. Um, and yet only 99 were launched by the Space Shuttle. Um, and it was, it was a bit of a disaster when it came down to it. And commerce has got here now, and GPS and things we take for granted, communication, satellite TV, all this stuff. It's just going in great lines. Huge amounts of money in this. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what the total amount is here, but it's seriously big. The people are making money out of it, so something's going on, which is good. It's a big market. So, what's the evolution of spaceflight in the new millennium? Well, near human spaceflight is in resurgence. Scientific exploration is about in orbit telescopes, like the Webb telescopes. Possibly a gravitational wave detector system in space, which I think would be really brilliant. Uh, probes, autonomous probes, robot landers, and so on. And lots of new technology, new emerging technologies. There's been strong commercialization, and there's been a kick in the seat of the pants of the people through the conventional rocket industry by these billionaires that come along and have made new things happen. And there's lots of new emerging technologies. And the thing that uh, is slightly worrying in all this time uh, is this new rush to put humans on Mars is, is a bit of a problem. I, I'm putting a spoiler in here now because if you try to make a mystery out of this, it's a waste of time. But I think putting humans on Mars is costly, suicidal, and unproductive. So that's my point at the end of all this. <laughs> uh, and can any country really afford to or justify the huge costs? to sustain human beings in messing around in a really hostile solar system. This is not like Antarctica or the top of Everest. This stuff is really, really dangerous. And I'll say something about the ethics a bit later on. So Mars, this mission to Mars, it's been around since Obama was talking about things. In fact, it should have gone in 1985, but the lack of public funding then stopped all that. And it would have been a disaster, I suspect. Uh, Mars is an interesting thing. It's uh, about one and a half times out the distance we are from the sun. So uh, you've got to use light years and things. Well, it's not light years. It takes eight minutes for the light to get from the sun to the Earth. And it takes about 12 minutes for the light to get from the sun to Mars. So that's the distance. As remember, we were talking about light years when we were thinking about the solar system itself and so on. Uh, what's good about it? Well, you feel less heavy. Uh, the gravity is about a third of the Earth. I uh, really love it. Uh, it, you can't breathe too well. Uh, the atmosphere is uh, carbon dioxide, 96%, so it's taxable, presumably. Uh, there's argon and nitrogen, not much. 0.15% uh, oxygen, that doesn't sound too good. Uh, the mean temperature is minus 63 Celsius, uh, with a high of 35 uh, in some places. Uh, the wind speeds are quite low, that's 65 miles an hour to 100 miles an hour. And you don't feel it. Well, if you're not able to feel it, because the density is so low. It's really, really low density and really low pressure. It's 0 0.006 atmospheres. One atmosphere is our pressure, and it's a thousandth of that. Basically. So that's quite extraordinary. So actually, moving around on Mars is not what you see in the movies. Um, this is a picture of Mount Sharp from Curiosity Rover. Uh, which was one launched by, uh, put down there by the robot. Uh, marvelous uh, machine, uh, teleoperated partly from the Earth with proper scientific instruments on it, which is looking at the chemical composition of the planet and trying to get up this hill. Well, it's going to make it, but it's, uh, it's doing well. And it's already found loads out. It shows that the radiation uh, on Mars is pretty lethal. Uh, there's no ionosphere or magnetosphere, uh, ultraviolet from the sun, which is about half what it is on Earth, comes straight out. So do all the other cosmic rays and everything else inside. 
is an exceptionally dangerous radiation hazard environment. Um, all the dust you see there is electrified, it's all electrostatics. Uh, there are very strong environmental effects, which I won't go into, about living on Mars, which just seem to be absolutely pointless. What I really love, which is such a great idea, because people were planning on doing this mission before they actually found out what was there, but lots of the probes, like Curiosity, have already found that the soil is toxic. Right? Most of the soil is uh, nanophase uh, Fe203, it's an iron oxide, and uh, things like olivine, and lots of smashed up volcanic material that's turned to a fine dust. The, the dust on Mars has the consistency <coughs> of talcum powder. I'm not making this up. Curiosity has gone and looked at the stuff and it's fired lasers at it, it's measured at it, it knows exactly what you're doing with it. But the toxic soil is calcium perchlorate. Now, I would say something that sounds as though I'm more positive than I, than I probably do. But uh, the positive thing is that uh, what are perchlorates good for? Well, um, it's calcium, uh, ClO4 twice, so it's a lot of oxygen in there, and it's of course used as a rocket fuel uh, in solid state rockets. So we can get back. And there's oxygen there, so we get the oxygen out, and we use the chlorine to clean the loop. Uh, so that should be okay. Uh, um, the only problem is that uh, what's the concentration of perchlorate? Well, if you look at your warning things on anything with perchlorate on it, you can see that it's very tiny amounts are really dangerous to humans and any living thing. And uh, the amount on the soil on Mars is between a half and one percent of the soil. The top soil. It's not real soil because there's no organisms there. But the top half is toxic. So it's lethal. And because it's talcum powder, how are you going to clean it out the filters? So you send these people there, and they say, oh, sorry, you know, what, what happened to health and safety? <laughs> the dust effects are bad. You can completely obscure the planet for months at a time by the clouds which are set up by the winds, not strong winds, but it's, it's a very thin atmosphere, and this stuff will whip this garbage up and pass all this toxic stuff all the way around everything you've got. So you could live a thousand feet underground, I suppose. Um, it begs the question, what do you do about the crew health? Uh, journey into space, they took a doctor with them. <laughs> so they really thought about all that. And they actually went through some of this stuff. It's, it's quite interesting. And they worried about carbon dioxide, it's not good to breathe. And how long do you last if you take your helmet off? Uh, so the crew health is, a, is an issue. Uh, there's other stuff. Prolonged low gravity, prolonged low light, psychological effects of isolation from the Earth, lack of using the internet, uh, <laughs> social media. Actually, this is well one good argument for going, this one says. Uh, well, this has all been studied and uh, is ignored by the newspapers. But there are millions of people, well, not really, it's hundreds of people, who volunteer to help with this. In 2007 to 2011, there was an experiment between Russia, the ESA, that's the European lot, and uh, China, uh, to simulate uh, living on Mars for 520 days. Uh, I mean, it's just, you couldn't make this stuff up. Uh, I'm not even going to explain this to you, but they just did this stuff and said, it's fine, no problem. Well, so she's sitting on Earth, you know, I mean, it's, it's a completely different game. And there was nothing toxic there, at all. And they didn't have any failures, they didn't even have any Apollo 13 moments when they should have just shut down the whole system and said, what are you going to do now with the duct tape? Uh, they didn't do that. Anyway, there'd be loads of this stuff. And lots of old, young people volunteer for this all the time. It's, it's, it's absolutely amazing. You don't see old people volunteer for it. <laughs> a good thing. Um, well, just getting to Mars is a problem. Uh, there's the solar wind, which is deadly ionizing radiation to the rest of us. It's going to hit that spacecraft for several months as you're making your journey from the Earth to Mars. And then it's still there when you get out and go through customs. Uh, on the right, you can see this is, a, this is the sun that's being blotted out in the middle here. It's a time lapse, which you can read at the bottom if you can look fast enough. 2001, of a coronal mass ejection. If you, if you look carefully, you see, boom, it suddenly goes off. And so they do it again. There it goes. And that's the size of the sun inside that little circle in the middle. 
So that is big, and if that's showing up like that, that's a lot of serious high energy stuff that's been chucked out in space. And if you're uh, on the Earth when a big coronal mass ejection takes place and it's aimed right at you, it can knock out not just your GPS systems, it can knock out power stations and so on. It's, it's a serious In fact, people still worry about this, but usually it misses. But if you're out in space and that thing's spreading out, you've got a little tiny spaceship, you need to worry. Uh, fortunately, people like Ruth Bamford, as you know, I met many years ago, uh, was at the Rutherford Lab in Oxford, uh, she had a most brilliant idea. How do you do justify yourself if you work in the nuclear industry making bombs? Right? Uh, so what's a good use of, peaceful use of a bomb? Well, she said originally, well, you could put a nuclear bomb just going off all the time, uh, continuously going off, behind a spacecraft, and that would form a big plasma. And if we had a little magnet in the spacecraft, that would interact with the plasma, and you would get a magnetosphere around the spacecraft, just like the magnetic field of the Earth causes a magnetosphere, which you can see in this picture on the right. That's the Earth, supposedly. Exaggerated distances here. There's the sun. Here's a wave of garbage coming out. Um, these are the lines of magnetic force of the uh, magnetic field structure uh, around the Earth. It's a dipole, all bent to one side by the plasma that's impinging on it. Here's the shock wave, the bow shock wave for it. And that magnetosphere is what saves this planet from getting zapped by all this rubbish that the sun's checking out. But if you're in a spacecraft, can you do the same? And she said originally, we just put a bomb there. Um, anyway, that got a lot of publicity, and she got a lot more money, and now she's done it properly. Uh, wonderful stuff. Uh, what you can see in the bottom slide is their idea. Uh, this is a European collaboration. Uh, here's a big superconducting magnet. And uh, here is uh, part of the space vessel, and this is the crew quarters. And there is a, uh, a region here, which is called the safe region, the diagnostic cavity, which is a little bit like this region here, where you've got a hole where it's safe. And what they've done is they've introduced a plasma into this region, and because of this magnetic field here, the plasma forms this shock wave and protects all the occupants. Now, the Earth's magnetic field. Uh, I never know what to do with units, I've forgotten how Gauss and Ersteds and things work, but I can do it in Teslas. Uh, the Earth's uh, magnetic field is around right about 44,000 nano-Teslas. I just think 44,000. Um, what you need to stop the uh, solar wind and use the solar wind to protect you by making this artificial magnetosphere around your spacecraft is a few hundred nanoteslas. So you could do it with quite a small magnet. And the idea is you would only turn this on when you needed to. You get the bounce warning of the weather forecast for the sun, and you'd see something building up, and then you turn it on. And you may want to turn it on big, very strong magnetic fields, in case something really nasty happens, like a coronal mass ejection. And this is what their idea is. And this is a laboratory thing that was done at uh, uh, Rutherford Lab, of an actual experiment doing this, full scale. System. Uh, how do you make the plasma? Well, originally we were going to think of having a nuclear drive or something. But you could just inject xenon, xenon ions, around the spacecraft. There's enough, according to this model, to produce a productive area around it. Um, the problem is this has never been tested in space, and there's all sorts of other issues with it. But I think it's a cool idea. And I think that's good thinking. That's thinking in advance about how you might solve this. It doesn't stop the big ejections. You'd, you'd never be able to cope with that. And there's worse. That's an X-class <laughs> solar flare from 2014. It's a real picture made in different wavelengths to show you the effect. You can see this horrible thing coming up. Uh, and that's serious high-energy X-rays. And one thing we know about X-rays, they, they go through metals, like spacecraft, <laughs> fairly easily. There are ethical issues about all this. Uh, genetic damage, there's been a twin experiment done, Scott Kelly went into space uh, three years ago on the uh, space station, uh, leaving his twin brother, who is not an astronaut, uh, on Earth, and uh, when he came back a year later, they started looking at his genetics, they checked his DNA, they found all sorts of interesting things, because he changed his height, all sorts of things happened to him in space, most of that had recovered after a few months, but there's been a substantial shift in his DNA. 
He is genetically different now from what he was before. That's one year. So you imagine sitting on Mars where you're going to get the same problems. Again, it's low gravity. All the factors are there. Uh, some idiots have said, we'll have one-way missions. Why don't they just call them suicide missions? Uh, well, we'll get millions of volunteers and just go out there. Well, you know, I, I just cannot see what the legal basis for that is. Uh, Mars to stay project. <laughs> Sometimes called. Uh, maybe this is what we'll do when we can't feed our old age pensioners much longer. Than just the Brits will send all their OAPs out to Mars and anybody circles in the NHS. So that's solved that problem. Well, journey to the stars. Oh, come on. 4.7 light years. There is a nearby planet, Proxima Centauri, one of the nearby stars, uh, has an exoplanet there, so, which means a planet outside that solar system, which is rocky, which probably means uninhabitable. Uh, but that's the nearest neighbor we know. And so I think those astronomers were quite correct. Space travel on these big distances at the moment is bunk because you cannot see the path. We're not ready for this. And if the large distances are involved, you better do something really stupid, like say, we've got a faster than light travel mechanism. Actually, there are people who think you can do that. Um, one is really interesting. I wasn't going to mention this, but it's, it's insane sort of thing. <laughs> Uh, there are, if you look at general relativity carefully enough, uh, there are ways of distorting space-time so you could make a bubble around the spacecraft and it could fly faster than the speed of light in some other region. So you'd have to cover huge distances very effectively. And uh, you can do the maths on this, it's, it's, it's a beautiful result because what's really nice, no one does this if you're a theoretician, so you never do the numbers properly if you're a theoretician, you do the dimensionless because you never know how big anything is. And I speak from experience here. Um, but if you do the numbers, put the numbers in, you need energies which are like collapsing a whole galaxy, <laughs> converting the matter to energy to get this effect to work. So I don't think that's a worry. Um, okay, so what else we do? Well, there are two approaches in our ser austerity that I wanted to talk about. Let's sort of briefly go through some of the models here. Automatic remote sensing uh, means can we do, are we clever? about the way we sense information from a distance. Astronomers already do this when they look at science and so on. But there are other things we can do, like exploring Mars and things like that from a distance. And I'm going to give you some examples of that. Unmanned probes, we already know they're called drones in warfare. And there are also these annoying little camera things that fly around photographing you when you're sunbathing in the car. And uh, those, those can be made autonomous quite easily now. We know enough about artificial intelligence and robots, robotics to do that. The first robotic lander, by like Curiosity, which I say is their big achievement, was to land that module, the Curiosity itself, by this thing wobbling over, looking at the ground, figuring it. They didn't do it perfectly. And the reason they had to do it was not because this is the intelligent way to do it, they did it because the alternative was to use airbags. Now, the Brits used airbags when they put Beagle 2 up, and we know what happened to that. Uh, when the lander is big enough, an airbag is not good enough to land with, so they're having to land properly now. And the billionaires have shown us how to do that, so that's, that's nice. There's lots of new and emergent technology which is not time to talk on. There's intelligent data processing possible through billions of amounts of data now, which uh, is starting to appear in astronomy and in uh, space analysis and so on. Autonomous robots now exist. You can see these funny dogs that are wandering around from Boston Dynamics. They look quite cute, but they're military. That's what they were designed to They're designed to be military machines. Now, they're exceptionally dangerous, I think, because I don't think you could train them. <laughs> um, at least they don't wheel them over the floor, which is something. Uh, artificial intelligence, uh, uh, in the real sense, has not advanced a lot, but in, in practical senses, it's advanced enormously, and we haven't really used that properly. Low cost spaceflight is now. You can reduce the cost by huge amounts uh, by using the boosters again and things like this and changing the methods of propulsion and so on. And the stuff I'm really interested in is swarms, nano and femto satellites, there's hundreds of these up already. These are things about the size of a brick, the complete communication system. You chuck them up into orbit off some spacecraft and free ride off another spaceship. And you can use those to move in low Earth orbits, for instance, to distribute the internet to, say, Africa or something like that. That's the kind of good practical sense of using it. And these things are passing the signal from one to another and between the ground, 
lots of advanced electronics and systems engineering going in there, a lot known about it. It's growing like mad. I mean, every other satellite that's going up is one of these things. I'm interested in the really small ones, uh, particularly smart dust, which is things that are robotic systems about the size of the grain of sand. And I'll see why that is later. Uh, that's on the silly side of things at the moment, but not entirely silly, as we'll see. Um, let's just look at some quickly on remote sensing. Um, this is a map of Mars from the uh, Mars Orbiter Laser Altimeter uh, experiment, uh, which mapped Mars in detail. Uh, it's color coded, so low is blue, and this is very low. This is the Hellas Basin, massive area. It's the biggest impact crater in the solar system. It's so big that it's pushed the Earth up, or well, Mars is pushed up on the other side. You will realize this is an ordinary map, so that's one side of the planet, that's the other side of the map. It's shoved up, and what's it got there? A row of volcanoes, a massive volcano here, this huge uh, uh, Mariner Valley along here, which is the most amazing, chaotic. Uh, region. And over here is a nice quiet spot. It's called Cydonia. That's its coordinates if you want to look it up on Google Mars. And Google Mars will take you there, but it does not give you the route. <laughs> um, well, that was an interesting thing because in 1976, NASA released a photograph from the Viking mission uh, that had gone to Mars of the Cydonia region. Uh, this is a, a region uh, of about 80, no, 50 kilometers, I think it is, across here. And uh, what did they find in the photograph? I didn't really see this. Uh, it was a batch processor. This is the most crap photograph I've ever seen. And uh, maybe because it's been badly processed. And there is the famous face on Mars. <coughs> well, uh, I remember when this picture came out and I thought, that's a piece of rubbish. That's one of the worst photographs I've ever seen because it's been overblown. Uh, it's been processed. And you can see the noise. Every black spot in here is noise. The white spots too. I mean, it's full of noise, and you want to ask yourself, what's the pixel resolution of that? We'll come back to that later on. Well, that's the face on Mars, and uh, it's very interesting that uh, Glasgow had a part in all this. Uh, North Kelvin Side Secondary School um, existed during the 1970s up to the mid 90s, and it merged with Clevedon in Kelvindale. Um, in the late 90s, and it was finally demolished in 2003. And one Chris O'Kane, who I've never met, I, I, I understand, many people here know about this, uh, that he was a member of staff who encouraged the students to look at those NASA photographs and look at all that area. And they saw pyramids there as well as the face. And one of those pyramids is called the NK Pyramid, after North Celtic Science. Great, fantastic, no one else is doing this stuff. It's absolutely amazing. And I was teaching image processing and pattern recognition at the time, which is very boring to my students. So I was doing it all through space. So I was digging out stuff from friends I had in NASA, and they were sending me the raw data, and we said, we went looking at all this stuff. Then we heard about these people. So I thought, I don't believe there's pyramids there, uh, which is a correct scientific approach. And uh, so we looked at the raw data. That's actually good data from that region. You can just see the face on Mars there. Look at all this stuff here. Uh, there's all kinds of crossing. This is one of the better raw data images of the whole region. And uh, there's stuff in there. Well, we processed it uh, in Glasgow. That was 1977 data. That's our processing of it. Really bad because the pixel resolution is awful. It's something like 45 meters per pixel. And most of the bits that you've got were on a 64 pixel by 64 pixel array. So anyone who sees faces or measures sharp angles at that resolution. Well, so we looked at it and it kept the students happy for a bit. And uh, that was processed, that particular was in 1996. And the reason we did it is I was getting resurrected then, because in 1998 we knew we were going to get high resolution pictures, slightly better resolution. And in 1998, this is the original region up here of these pyramids. And uh, there's this particular pyramid. Now, this is not the NK pyramid, but it's an interesting one. And they, everyone sort of blurred their eyes and said, yes, these are straight angles and faces. This is the Egyptians got here first. <laughs> it appeared in Doctor Who, so it must be true. Blah, blah, blah. This is our, this is the Glasgow image processing, which is just as good as NASA's. I took the raw data, and the same evening, 
we have this stuff. You can actually see boulders on here, uh, which are quite big. They're sort of 14 foot across that sort of size. Um, and you can see the deep structure here. This is quite clearly a mesa. It's just like parts of Amazon. It's hard material, which has been weathered away um, by the Martian wind. So all that toxic stuff in it. Um, I'm not sure I showed you the NK pyramid. There it is. That's their pyramid. So that forever is Glasgow's contribution to Mars. <laughs> Uh, this is the face on Mars. I took the original data, and instead of trying to get what I wanted, I looked at the raw data and used the scientific stuff to extract all the garbage, the noise and so on. It's an easy thing to do in, in image processing. Uh, 43 meters per pixel resolution, and that's what the raw image looks like, uh, 64 by 64 array. And people say I needed that space, but humans are good at saying that's the face. This is what we did, which is a very fancy software, which I won't talk about here, but um, allowed us to reconstruct a three-dimensional image from this without feeding any extra information in at all, which is what other people have been feeding other information by making the image bigger. Um, and we did this because of the work I was doing on molecular electronics about trying to image molecules of atomic force microscopy. So it's a complicated business. But this is what we got. That's one view of it. That's what's looking this way. This is a side view. It doesn't look anything like a face. So, <laughs> and if you're a mummer of a great child, it's uh, obvious. Uh, this is the better data that came in 1998 of the face. That's the raw data, Mars Global Surveyor. That's my first pass at it before I corrected for the projection being peculiar. Uh, that's the original rubbish up here. And here's this laser. And the story. But that's remote sensing with limited uh, information, really bad signals, and yet we're getting all this stuff out by doing it properly. And you extend that to putting something with only a few pixel resolution out of the nearby star system, sending the data back over many years, maybe we could do things by just being smart about it. What people tend to do, it's like computers. If you've got a big computer, you don't think about the problem, you just push it on the big computer even if it had an analytical solution. Why do you do that? I don't know. Anyway, um, this is the best photograph we have. The European Space Agency, hooray for them. Uh, they did stereo cameras, high resolution. Uh, this is down to 1.4 meters per pixel resolution. And there is their best shot at the face on Mars, even with the correct colors. There's my picture from the 64 pixel thing. I don't think there's a lot of difference in that, actually. And it shows you that if you do the right thing, <coughs> you can get all the information out uh, by thinking about it. It's probably a bit smarter. So that's the thing about remote sensing. And that applies to lots of things that people do in space. We went on to look at craters, partly buried craters, heavily eroded craters. We use AI techniques and so on. Uh, we were able to take, take a picture of a crater from the uh, data from spacecraft, reconstruct a mathematical model of it automatically, and reconstruct three-dimensional maps of it, uh, and so on. So we could then look at really interesting things like uh, this field here is a field of buried craters, partly buried craters, and we could extract the crater structures under here automatically uh, and get 3D profiles of them. This is really beautiful. This looks like a circle. Right? These are boulders. This region is about 200 meters across. And these streaks are uh, little dust devil streaks on the surface of Mars. And there's rollers all over. We just ran that through the software, and it came out with a whole set of nested, buried crater structures in there. That's actually quite an interesting system. It's been buried under the sand. And the indentations, presumably, will allow the boulders to follow the indentations. There's a slight correlation in there, so you can see the circle where it's supposed to be. We did the same for looking at the Chicxulub crater in Mexico by looking at artesian wells. We did this with my brother-in-law, who's a geologist on that project. The second uh, austerity approach um, is to look at things like swarms, swarms and smart dust. There's a lot of dust on Mars. That's a dust fall. It's not a waterfall. It's dust flying over the edge of the crater. This is lovely sand dunes. 
And this is smart dust. Uh, this thing in the middle is uh, a lump of silicon, one to two millimeters across. This was worked out in the late 90s. I met these people who were doing this in that period. And uh, they got an entire system on there, sensors, communications, everything, two millimeter size. And uh, we were interested in, okay, you can do all this stuff, and they were thinking of using it for surveillance techniques and things. The military were very interested in this. Um, but I want to know how the hell you could move this stuff around so it could be useful. Could you have lots of these things communicating with each other, exploring a region on their own, and sending you the information? And there's even ways that tiny things like this can send a big signal to you using phase array techniques, which is too much of this talk, but it's, it's one way you could do it. And so something the size of a grain of sand, how could moats move and communicate? And I started thinking about Martian exploration, and uh, we came up with some ideas aimed at 2021 nanotechnology trillions of devices on a small scale. But well, well, how sand moves on Mars is it the motion of smart dust is identical to the motion of the sand, or the little particles on Mars. It's the motion of wind-blown sand that was worked out by a guy called Bagnall way back in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, the basic process is called saltation. The particles are lofted into the air and uh, by impact of other particles, and they sort of hop and float along and then go down and then they wake and come up again. Now on Earth, that's not a big effect. We can sometimes see it in the desert, of, uh, particularly in Arizona, where you can see, I'm told in Saudi as well, that you can see uh, sand moving across over a flat area, and it can go up to your knees, and the saltation process is, is visible. On Mars, the trajectories are colossal. And so I ran a simulator for this uh, effect to try and see what happened. And these are the kind of hopping trajectories. This is a range of meters here, 400 meters. And the trajectories are 100 times bigger than on the Earth. And that's with low gravity, low density air. Yeah, that's the basic reason. Otherwise, the hydrodynamics is very similar. And I ran a hydrodynamics model to, to look at this. And we did loads of stuff on that. Then we thought, well, how, how the hell do you navigate with this? Because what I wanted to do was to use our understanding of how sand moved to see how you could change it. What changes sand's movement is if you change this drag coefficient. If you roughen the surface up, it will tend to stay in the wind flow. If you smooth the surface, it will tend to sink. And we investigated the idea of a shape-changing grain of sand, where you put an electroactive polymer around your tiny chip, and you let it change shape when you were going the wrong way. So if you're going the wrong way, you'd make it sink down, and if you're going the right way, you'd roughen it up, and it would go and move along with the wind. And we tried to see whether you could get things to fly in formation and do anything interesting, and it certainly worked. So uh, I wrote some papers on this, and uh, we got <coughs> someone who did uh, who did, involved in an ex exhibition on this stuff, and uh, this is uh, his picture of the smooth particle and the rough particles going up and down around the dust hill on Mars. Uh, we looked at the idea of um, larger swarms using different technology, but the same kind of communication models, and navigation models for going to other planets and uh, I was looking at this uh, with a view to uh, do some practical things on that at one time. That was back in 2007. Well, what's been going on since all this, and since I retired, is these billionaires. Now, if I'd been a billionaire, gosh, would I have wasted it on space travel? I don't know, but it's... Uh, anyway, I'm only going to mention a few of these. Uh, Jeff Bezos, who is the founder of Amazon, uh, launched the Blue Origin program in 2000. It is, it's a lot of odd-looking things, is not it? Uh, this is the Falcon Heavy rocket, which uh, PayPal founder Elon Musk, who founded SpaceX and Tesla and all these other things, uh, has just launched, and I say he put a car in it, which is brilliant. And he's got a rocket called the BFR. And he says, it's really the big Falcon rocket, but it's not. <laughs> And uh, it's like the B-52 bomber, it's called the Buff in America. It's uh, the same thing, like, as this is a polite audience. Here's how big these things are. This is the original Saturn V, that's the Soviet moon rocket. This is the BFR. Uh, I'm not showing the Falcon that's just gone up, because it's actually quite tiny, it's not about this sort of size down here. This is the Blue Origin rocket here, the new plane. And, uh, this thing on the left, in, uh, oh, sorry, on the right, the USA thing on SLS Block 1B is the big American launcher that is being prepared for doing the next lot of manned missions. They're going to be diverted to Mars, in fact, uh, to the moon, in fact, but 
they are aiming at this at Mars as well. And only parts of the system are really ready. They are really big, but they're not any bigger than the Saturn V, but they're more efficient. So I'm sure it's and then they'll have to mention one billionaire. I've forgotten his name, but anyway, uh, this billionaire wants to make his country great again. And uh, he remembers all the great things, like steelworks and coal, and moon landings. So he's told them all to go back to the moon, which is a bit of a shock for people planning the Mars budget. Uh, no one knows what's happened to the budget. It's not known whether the Mars mission can survive us. He told people yesterday that we're going to Mars. He told the Marines, so it must be true. Uh, that's such a true story. Um, but what happens to the International Space Station? If you do the sums from these figures that I've shown you, you, you can't do it. So good luck. I want to finish with one billionaire who's done some amazing stuff. This is the guy, Yuri Milner, who's Russian, lives in Moscow. And he's had a series of, uh, he's a dot com billionaire. And he has given huge amounts of money to big scientific projects. Fantastic, benevolent, cool way of looking at it. Fun stuff, and go off the ground. And uh, he's produced this project uh, to produce an interstellar probe called the Starship. It's called the Breakthrough Starship Project. Uh, it was launched in April 2016, and it started up in 2016. Stephen Hawking was one of the people who's been championing this, and we've worked with, worked with him, but not on the technical stuff, as far as I understand. Uh, the idea is to send a fleet of a thousand centimetre sized uh, core spacecraft, smart dust actually, uh, with solar sails, which had been invented in fact uh, for the smart dust in, by Colin McInnes in Glasgow uh, many years ago. Five metre diameter sails, which are not the ones which you're seeing in the press today to celebrate Hawking. Uh, these round ones here. You fire, you put a thousand of these in orbit. Then you get a uh, one kilometre square array of lasers, two gigawatt power, nuclear power station size, and you zap each one of them in turn by the whole array using phased array locking to power these things and push them through photon pressure up to 15 to 20% the speed of light. And you leave it. And off it goes. And inside it's got basically a smart dust chip. And they're aiming to go to Proxima Centauri B, which I mentioned before. Hugely ambitious this. I can think of about 20 engineering problems that are completely non-solved for this at the moment, but I, this is a great idea. And they're doing exactly what all the nanosat people are doing, or smart dust people are doing. That's what they just sent into space uh, last summer. They sent a few of these up with a radio, an antenna, solar cells, microcontroller. This is primitive compared to stuff, for instance, that's been going on in, uh, in Thames Group in Glasgow, who's been developing the Scottish version of all this, which is called Smart Specs. It sounds like spec saver, but I don't think it's a good name. I think Smart Dust is better, although it's fluffier. Uh, anyway, these little things are called sprites, and they've been launched, they were launched from India. And it went up on an Indian rocket and so on. So this stuff is working. So it's, it's up there in space. And they're doing some cool stuff. They're making you think about really exploring space, not with human beings, but with swarms of things. So the redundancy kicks in. You can lose half of them and we don't care. But they cooperate together. They can cooperate to make a phased array signal to send a big signal back towards the Earth. The round trip on this is huge. It's 30 years to get there. Look around and send the signal back, or come back. <laughs> Probably nobody here. Um, anyway, that's the big thing. Uh, let me finish now, so I'm going to shoot you slightly here. Um, my conclusions. Uh, manned space exploration outside near-Earth orbit is costly, suicidal, and non-productive. Uh, autonomous robotics is a better way of doing all this. Swarm intelligence, which is cooperative robotics, basically, network together. We know how to do giant networks now. This is all doable stuff. Low-cost methods like solar sailing for interstellar probes. That's doable. It could be done. I don't see why they're doing this in such small things. I would do some bigger things. But the problem is they can't get enough thrust. They can't get this velocity of light. My view on this in 2007, I paper on this, was to use uh, an iron engine, which is low thrust. You just leave it on for a year. And you leave an iron engine on for a year, 
as problems in doing that, but the iron en engines actually exist, uh, you could get something up to, cl not close to the speed of light, but certainly a decent percentage, you get the same result. And you'd have a lot more firepower to, to play around. So there's other ways of doing this, but it's a great thing. So nanosats and femosats, uh, and femosats are already establishing the core technology. The wireless networking and swarms has been looked at in massive detail over years. The journals devoted to this now. There are conferences where there's been a thousand people on it. And we put our ideas there. And I listen to stuff, it just amazes me what's, what's going on. Distributed telescopes and sensors I'm in favor of. I can't see why if you can have a smart network of spacecraft. We can't have the, you know, you look at some of these giant mirrors that we've got in telescopes in Chile. There's hundreds of different mirrors all moved in sync to get the signal. You can do that by putting cameras out in space, knowing the position of each and locking all those signals together. We could build giant telescopes in space with swarms. And uh, I think there's some future in that. And um, telescopes in space, definitely a good idea. And lots of sensors. So less drawn, more thought, and share the costs and benefits with other people. And uh, one of the final things I want to say is, um, it's always, as I think when you try to talk on this subject, someone always says aliens. And uh, after Brexit, we'll all be aliens. <laughs> but, uh, uh, I'm looking for alien life. Uh, my view is better lie low. Um, because if they're as smart as us and they're as mean as us, we don't want to know them. Uh, and I thought we should end on a happy note. And this is a real photograph taken from Elon Musk's, I keep wanting to say Tusk, it's Musk, different man. This is his car, a Tesla Roadster, in his personal collection. Inside the open spacecraft, this is the payload thing opened up, and in there is this mannequin playing music, and it's got a toy car in there as well. Clever marketing, this will be available at Christmas, folks. I'm not joking. If they put the toy car there with a mannequin in it so they could sell it, and yeah, it's brilliant. Um, so, is this the end? Well, it's the end of the talk, or is it the beginning of something interesting? Thank you very much.